Hello, welcome to Zoology 142. This is our first lecture on the urinary system. So in today's lecture, we're going to have an overview of kidney functions. We're also going to talk about the gross morphology and histology of the kidney, and also discuss the vasculature or blood vessels that surround the kidney. We're going to talk about nephron morphologies. Uh, nephrons are the functional units of kidneys, and also talk about nephron physiology. And finally, we're going to review filtration and reabsorption, the two processes by which nephrons within the kidney actually clean our blood. And finally, we're going to start a discussion about glomerular filtration, which will continue on into our next lecture. Okay, the organs of the urinary system include the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra. Uh, the kidneys are bilateral organs, that is, we have one on the right and left sides. Um, they are located just underneath the ribs. Uh, the one on the right-hand side is slightly lower because of the size of the liver is actually uh, pushing it down a little bit. And the kidneys are responsible for filtering blood, and we'll talk a lot about how they do that in the upcoming slides. The ureters actually transport uh, the filtrate, or the urine, uh, from the kidneys to the urinary bladder where it's going to be stored. And finally, the and finally, the urethra is just a muscular tube that helps to convey the urine from the urinary bladder from the urinary bladder to the outside of the body. And of course, that urethra has urethral sphincters on there, so we can choose when we want to go to the bathroom. Okay, there's a lot of different functions for the kidney. Uh, one of the functions is to regulate the concentration of various blood ions or electrolytes. And these are things such as sodium, potassium, and calcium. It also helps us to regulate blood pH by regulating the balance of hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions, and it also is essential for regulating blood volume. Uh, remember that if you drink a very large quantity of fluid, that that fluid gets absorbed in the small intestine, and if that fluid is not pulled out of the bloodstream, uh, we can look at a large increase in blood pressure and a large increase in blood volume. So what your kidneys do is help to pull out the excess water when you consume too much water so that it won't have a great effect on either blood volume or blood pressure. So, so regulating blood pressure, of course, is another big function of the kidney, as is maintaining the osmolality or salt to water ratio uh, within the blood. And finally, the kidney also is important for producing a few hormones, uh, most important of which is erythropoietin, or EPO. And remember, erythropoietin was a hormone that was responsible for uh, manufacture of red blood cells within the red bone marrow. And finally, uh, the and finally, the kidney is also important for excretion of metabolic wastes such as nitrogen. And finally, the kidney is also important for excretion of metabolic wastes such as urea and uric acid. And we're going to talk more about... Okay, let's look at the external anatomy of the kidney. You can see that there's an indentation on the medial side of the kidney, which is called the renal hilus, or sometimes the renal hilum. And the hilum is just, again, an indentation where the blood vessels uh, enter and exit the kidney, and also where the ureters uh, enter and exit, the, and also where the ureters exit the kidney. The outer stroma, or framework of the kidney, consists of a fibrous connective tissue, renal capsule, Superficial to the renal capsule, we have a adipose capsule that's made of adipose tissue, and that helps to cushion the kidney and also prevents it from jostling around. And finally, superficial to the adipose capsule, we have something called renal fascia, and this is a tough fibrous connective tissue that's semi-transparent that holds the kidneys to the back of the body wall. Remember, the kidneys aren't actually in the same cavity with all the other abdominal organs. They are behind peritoneum, and so we say that kidneys are retroperitoneal. Now let's go take a look at the parenchyma, or functional parts of the kidney. The first of these functional parts, just below the capsule, is the renal cortex. Uh, the renal cortex is where some of the nephrons are located, and we'll be talking about them in just a second. Now, for the most part, the cortical tissue is in the superficial part of the kidney, that is towards the outside, but there are some exceptions. The renal columns are made of cortical tissue that delve deep into the interior of the kidney, and they tend to be lighter in color than the medullary tissue, which we're going to look at next. <laughs> 
Okay, deeper within the kidney we have the medulla, and the medulla consists of these darkly colored renal pyramids. Uh, the renal pyramids are actually going to be saltier in nature than the cortex. Uh, so if we look at the kidney and look at its osmolality, we're going to see that the kidney actually gets saltier the deeper you go into the interior, and that will be important and talk, and that will be a and that is important because it helps the kidney to reabsorb water. Okay, then there's something called a renal lobe. A renal lobe is simply one of those renal pyramids from the medulla along with the overlying uh, cortical tissue and the surrounding uh, columns. So the columns plus the so the columns plus the pyramids become the renal lobe. And each kidney has somewhere between 3 to 6 so each human kidney will have somewhere between five and six. So each human kidney will have somewhere between four and six uh, renal lobes. Within uh, within the interior of the kidney, branching. So nephrons are the functional unit of the kidney, and they are found both within the cortex tissue and also within the medullary tissue. And we'll talk about the functions of nephrons here in just a couple slides. So as you probably know, one of the functions of the kidneys is to filter the blood and produce urine or waste products from that filtered blood. And so that filtration process will start in the medulla and also the cortex. And as urine is produced, it will basically dribble down the tips of the pyramids, and these are called the papilla of the pyramids uh, from the medulla, and there will enter a hollow open space called the calyces. Now the calyces are basically conduits for urine to reach the renal pelvis, and there are minor calyces and also major calyces. The minor calyces basically unite to form a major calyx, and the, these major calyces uh, basically empty this urine into the, renal pel into the renal pelvis. If you're taking a look at the picture at right, you can see that the minor calyces look like the ears of Shrek. You know who Shrek is, uh, the guy played by Michael Myers uh, on the Disney movie. If you look at Shrek's ears and if you look at a minor calyx, they're almost identical. So hopefully you won't forget those. So anyway, the urine comes and so anyway, the urine will proceed from the papilla of the pyramid through the minor calyx into the major calyx and eventually into the renal pelvis. And from there, it's going to proceed uh, towards the urinary bladder via the ureters. Okay, so we already said that one of the functions of the kidneys was to filter the blood, and it's important to realize just how much blood is going to the kidneys at any one time. Uh, on average, it's about 25% of your cardiac output. So even though the kidneys are very small, they actually demand and require a lot of blood in order to work uh, properly. So let's follow the pattern of circulation of blood coming into the kidneys via the renal artery. Okay, that renal artery will branch off into something called segmental arteries, and those segmental arteries will then branch off to basically go around the renal lobes through something called the interlobar arteries. Uh, and then it will branch up up top and we'll see something called an arcuate artery. This is an arc-like artery at the top of the pyramid. And these arc-like arteries will have projections going into the cortex called the cortical radiate arteries. And so basically the venous supply is basically now we don't. Now the venous circulation is basically the opposite of what we saw in the arterial circulation. So venous blood is picked up by our cortical, by our cortical radiate veins. It then proceeds to our arcuate veins and into our interlobar veins, and finally into the segmental veins, and and finally into the segmental veins and exits the kidney via the renal vein. There are also some small or microscopic vessels that are very important for kidney function. The first of these is something called a glomerulus. A glomerulus uh, basically branches off an afferent arteriole, and it is an area where we have filtration going on. That is, fluid is extruded through this very leaky capillary bed, and then it enters the nephron. Another type of another type of capillary bed that we have is something called the peritubular capillaries. The peritubular capillaries surround the nephron, specifically what we call the nephron loop or loop of Henle, and they're a very important site for the reabsorption of solutes and fluids back into the bloodstream. And we'll talk about the process of reabsorption in just a minute. And then finally, the vasa recta. These are just straight veins or arteries. Uh, 
Okay, now let's take a look at some nephron anatomy. There are basically two different regions of the nephron. The first part is called the renal corpuscle, and the second part is called the renal tubule. The renal corpuscle consists of the glomerulus and the glomerular capsule, or Bowman's capsule. The point of the, glomer the glomerulus is a very leaky capillary bed that is under extremely high pressure, and so is an area where we have filtration, that is the process of fluid moving out of the bloodstream into the Bowman's capsule. So the Bowman's capsule or so the Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule is simply a funnel or receptacle to collect all that filtered fluid that was produced by the glomerulus. It basically collects the fluid and then puts it into the renal tubule. So the renal tubule is basically everything else in the nephron and it consists here of the proximal convoluted tubule and remember proximal means near so it's near to the glomerulus and convoluted just means that it's wavy and so the whole pr Distal to the proximal convoluted tubule is the loop of Henle or nephron loop. And this is an area where we have a lot of solute and also water being reabsorbed. There's two limbs to the loop there's two limbs to the loop of Henle. The one with the arrow pointed to it is called the descending limb because that's where fluid is going to be traveling downwards through that limb. And if you look on the opposite side of the page, you'll see that there's an ascending limb, and that's going to bring fluid up towards the collecting duct. Okay, just distal to the Okay, just distal to the ascending loop. Okay, just Okay, just distal to the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, we have something called the distal convoluted tubule. We have something called the distal convoluted tubule. Remember, distal means further away from and convoluted means it's wavy, and this is also an area where we have a lot of reabsorption going on. And finally, the last structure here is something called the collecting duct. The collecting duct is a, bare, is a very large, the collecting duct is a relatively large, uh, straight chambered structure that collects all the urine that is produced by the nephron. Now, there's two different types of nephrons in the kidney. Uh, 80 to 85 percent of the nephrons in the kidney are going to be what we call cortical nephrons. That is, the majority of the nephron resides within the shallow cortex of the kidney. And so they do have a rather short loop of Henle that only penetrates a little ways into the outer medulla. Whereas only 15 to 20 percent of our nephrons are very long loop nephrons called juxtamedullary nephrons. And that's because they have a glomerulus that's deep in the cortex, but a very long loop of Henle that proceeds well down into the medulla. And these are important for producing very concentrated or dilute urine. Uh, depending on your hydration status, you may want to produce a lot of very dilute urine or a little bit of very concentrated urine. And it's these juxtamedullary nephrons that enable us to do so. Okay, so we already said that nephrons were the functional units of the kidneys, and it's interesting to know that each human kidney has somewhere between 800,000 and 1.2 million nephrons in it. Um, we can live without... Now the interesting thing about nephrons is they can grow in size throughout our life, but they will not change in number. You're born with all the nephrons you're going to have and, are probably, and have probably lost several by this point in life. Uh, you can survive with only one kidney, that is half the number of nephrons, because the nephrons in the remaining kidney will tend to grow larger or hypertrophy in order to take up the work of the missing kidney. So we already said that the main function of the kidneys and the nephrons within them is to clean the blood, remove waste products, and also conserve water. And it does this by doing three different processes. The first of these processes is something called filtration. Filtration is the pressure-driven movement of fluid out of the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. Remember, the glomerulus is just a very leaky capillary bed, but it's also a capillary bed under very high pressure. And so we have a lot of fluid leaking out of these leaky capillaries into the Bowman's capsule. The second process is something called reabsorption. Reabsorption is the movement of fluid from the renal tubule back into the bloodstream. 
And so usually things that are reabsorbed are things that we want to keep in the body, such as water or glucose. And so reabsorption helps us to reclaim anything that we want to hang on to because anything that stays as filtrate within this renal tubule without being reabsorbed will eventually be lost in the urine. So the majority of solutes and majority of fluids is actually, so the majority of fluids, so the majority of water, for example, is going to be reabsorbed in so the, so the majority of water, for example, is going to be reabsorbed from the tubule back into the peritubular capillaries. Okay, the last process is secretion. Secretion is the process of taking a waste product from the blood and placing it in the renal tubule. So it travels in the same direction as filtration, but the mechanism is different. And secretion is a very important way to get rid of metabolic waste products, for example, uric acid and urea. So now that we've had an overview of the anatomy and also the physiology of a nephron, we're going to go back and take a closer look at the renal corpuscle. Remember the renal corpuscle consisted of the glomerulus and also the Bowman's capsule. And the function of this renal corpuscle was to filter the blood. That is, blood will come into the glomerulus, which is essentially a very leaky capillary bed via the afferent arterial, and much of the fluid in that blood will be forced out into the Bowman's capsule. Uh, any cells and things that re remain within the glomerulus will exit the glomerulus through something called the efferent arterial. But we do have a lot of fluid, in fact, crossing that glomerular membrane and entering the opening to the proximal convoluted tubule. So the walls of the capillaries, as well as the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule, form something called the filtration membrane. The filtration membrane enables us to separate some of the liquid components of blood from the cellular components. And so it's composed of three layers which sequentially sieve out smaller and smaller elements. The first of these are fenestrations or pores that are found. Um, the first of these are fenestrations, that is pores that block blood. <laughs> The first of these are fenestrations in the capillary wall. These are small holes that allow fluid, like water, to move through, but are too small to allow blood cells to move uh, to move through the cap to move through to move through. So the first layer is. So the walls of the capillaries have fenestrations in them. These are. So the walls of the capillaries have. So let's start starting with the inside layer. Starting with the inside layer, we see that the wall of the capillary has fenestrations or windows in there. These are small pores that allow fluid like water to move through, but are too small to allow blood cells and large proteins and large proteins to move through. The next layer is something called the basal lamina, and this again protects uh, and this again prevents large proteins from moving from the glomerulus uh, into the Bowman's capsule. And finally, on the outside, we have some cells called podocytes, or literally foot cells, that have interdigitating feet that basically form something called a slit membrane. And the slit membrane even prevents medium-sized proteins, for, for example, albumin, from entering the filtrate. And so what we have is a very fine filter that's made up of three different layers. So in essence, you can think of the glomerulus and filtration membrane as a very fine sieve or colander. So take a look at the picture right. We've cooked some noodles and some water. And I want you to imagine these noodles as being analogous to blood cells and large proteins. And when we put them into the glomerulus, hence the colander, uh, what's going to come through the other side of that glomerulus? Well, in this case, we're only going to have water and maybe some salt if we had salt in our pasta coming through. The large noodles, which are symbolizing here the proteins in the blood and also the blood cells, tend to be retained within the glomerulus. And so the glomerulus is just basically a sieve that will allow very small things like water and glucose and sodium to pass into the Bowman's capsule and everything else is moves and everything else and everything else will leave the glomerulus through the efferent arterial. Now we call the liquid that enters the Bowman's capsule the glomerular filtrate because it was filtered from the glomerulus and entered the Bowman's capsule. And again, it consists mainly of water, some ions and electrolytes, and also a little bit of glucose. The filtration fraction is the percent of blood that is entering the afferent arterial that will become filtrate. So this depends on a variety of factors. The primary factor determining how much filtration goes on in the glomerulus is something called the net filtration pressure. 
and glomerular filtration is dependent on three pressures. One pressure that promotes filtration and two that oppose it. Now the primary pressure that promotes filtration is something called glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure or GBHP. Glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure is basically the pressure generated by the heart as it contracts. Now normally capillary beds don't tend to be very high in pressure, but the glomerulus is an exception. On average, the pressure within the afferent arterial is going to be around 55 millimeters of mercury of pressure. And this pressure again comes from contraction of the heart. Okay, our second pressure here is one that opposes or resists filtration, and it's called CHP, and CHP stands for capsular hydrostatic pressure. Remember that the capsule here is already filled with filtrate, and when we try to force one fluid into another fluid, we run into some resistance. You know, think about when you were a kid and you got your first fountain drink, and you would suck up a little bit of that fountain drink into the straw, and then if you were like me, you would try to blow it back down there again. And so you probably were aware of a little bit of resistance generated by, uh, generated by the fluid that was already in your drink uh, as you tried to force more fluid through the straw into the drink. And so this is analogous to capsular hydrostatic pressure. And so CHP is around 15 millimeters of mercury. Okay, a second pressure which resists filtration is something called blood colloid osmotic pressure, or BCOP. We've talked about BCOP before. Remember that the blood colloids are things like albumin. Because we have more cells and more albumin within the blood, they tend to they tend to draw water towards it. They tend to they tend to they tend to act like solutes, drawing water from the capsular. They tend to act like solutes, that is, sucking water from the capsular spaces. They tend to act like solutes, that is, sucking they tend to act like solids that is they can they tend to act like solids that is they tend to suck fluid from the capsule into the glomerulus that is they tend to suck fluid from the capsule into the glomerulus okay so the net filtration pressure is simply the blood okay so the net filtration pressure is simply the blood hydrostatic pressure Okay, so the net filtration pressure can be determined by subtracting the capsular hydrostatic pressure and blood colloid osmotic pressure from the glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure. And so if you do that here, you see that GBHP is 55 and CHP is 15 and BCOP is 30. And so if we subtract 30 and 15 from 55, we see that the net, we see that the net filtration pressure is 10 millimeters of mercury. And so now, so hopefully the slide so ho and so hopefully the slide lets you understand why pressure is important. Imagine what would happen, let's say, if the GBHP dropped down to forty five, what would the net filtration pressure be then? Well, if you do the math, you'll see that it's zero. And that means if we have blood pressure falling too low, essentially the kidneys can shut down. And so it's essential that the kidneys have a mechanism to make sure that the blood pressure is adequate to allow for filtration so that our kidneys can work. Okay, so there are two factors that promote Okay, so there are two factors that will help to promote glomerular filtration. First of these is that the glomerulus has a very large surface area, and surface area is good for pressure dri and surface area is excellent for allowing pressure driven movement of liquid and also solutes uh, from inside the glomerulus in the Bowman's capsule. The membrane itself is quite thin and also very very porous, and this again helps to facilitate filtration. The other thing that we pointed out already is that compared to other capillary beds, the blood pressure within the glomerulus is extremely high, again 55 millimeters of mercury, and this really helps to promote filtration, the movement of fluid from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. Okay, a lot of times when we're looking at somebody for suspected kidney disease, we'll want to calculate something called the glomerular filtration rate. And this is simply the amount of fluid filtered by all the glomeruli of both kidneys in one minute. And for most healthy adults, it's around 125 milliliters per minute. And it's directly related to the net filtration pressure within the glomerulus. And the interesting thing about, the interesting thing about glomerular filtration, the interesting, 
The interesting thing about GFR is that it tends to be constant as long as blood pressure is somewhere between 80 millimeters of mercury and 180 millimeters of mercury. So the kidney has so the kidney has some really neat mechanisms that help to maintain that help to maintain that help to maintain a very stable glomerular filtration rate. Okay, so given the G okay, so given the GFR Okay, so given that the glomerular filtration rate for an average person is around 125 milliliters per minute, let's figure out how much blood is in fact filtered in one day. Well, your average female will filter somewhere around 150 liters of blood in a given day. And remember, the average female probably has about five, uh, maybe six liters of blood. And so if you can't think of things in terms of liters, think about two liters. Think about a soda bottle. And so this would be equivalent to 75 two-liter bottles. That's a tremendous amount of volume that's filtered in one day. Males to because of their larger size, males tend to have an even larger because of their larger size, males tend to have an even larger volume of blood that's filtered, somewhere around 180 liters per day. That's about 90 two-liter soda bottles. That's a tremendous amount of fluid. Now remember that the body doesn't actually have, let's say, 150 or 180 liters. Most people have about five to six liters of blood in the body, and this means that we're filtering that blood several times a day. Now the important thing to realize about filtrate is potentially any filtrate that remains within the renal tubule will be lost as urine. And for human males, we have about 180 liters of fluid entering the renal tubule each day. So why don't we pee? Despite this, we tend to only urinate one to two liters per day. So what happens to this urine? Why is it in? So what happens to this extra volume? Why doesn't it end up in the urine? Well, the answer here is reabsorption. The excess fluid and electrolytes that initially were filtered out of the renal corpuscle uh, enter the renal tubule, and most of that is going to be reabsorbed in a process that we're going to take a look at, and we're going to take a look at this process in some detail, and we're going to, and we're going to take a look at this process in just a few minutes. Now, in the last slide, we talked about the ability of the kidney to maintain glomerular filtration rate at a relatively stable level, even though the blood pressure in the body might be fluctuating wildly. And this is because the body has this is because the kidney has two mechanisms for maintaining GFR. The first of these, one that is intrinsic, that is within the kidney, and the other that is in, and the other that is extrinsic, that is involves factors outside of the kidney. Basically, both the intrinsic and extrinsic factors. Basically, both the intrinsic and extrinsic factors will modify GFR in two ways. One, we will adjust the blood flow into or out of the glomerulus by adjusting the size or diameter of the afferent arterial. The other way we can modify, another way that we can modify filtration rate is basically to alter the permeability of the glomerular membrane. Okay, the primary way that the kidney maintains a Okay, the primary way that the kidney maintains a stable glomerular filtration rate is through something called the intrinsic controls. And intrinsic controls predominate as long as our blood pressure is somewhere between 80 and 180 millimeters of mercury. And we also call these intrinsic controls autoregulation. There are two types of autoregulation mechanisms, one of them called the myogenic mechanism and the other one called the tubulo the other one called the tubuloglomerular feedback mechanism. Okay, let's take a look at the first mechanism, the one that's called myogenic. What does the word root myo mean? Well, myo means muscle, and so this has something to do with muscular contraction within the arterioles. And so I want you to imagine that all of a sudden your blood pressure has gone up, and so instead of having a blood pressure, let's say 120 over 80, your blood pressure is now 180 over 90. And this increase in blood pressure is going to tend to increase the glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure. And remember, this is the primary force that was promoting filtration. So if blood pressure goes up, what should happen is that filtration should go up. But that doesn't happen because the kidney can autoregulate. Basically what happens is this increased force of blood entering the afferent arterial stretches the walls of the arterial just a little bit. And those arterial walls are lined with smooth muscle. 
and in response to being stretched they will reflexively contract which will reduce the flow of blood and the glomerulus and so this is one way to protect the glomerulus from too high a pressure because the glomerulus itself is a very delicate membrane and if we let too much pressure in there it's actually going to rupture and so the myogenic mechanism is very important for maintaining a stable GFR during normal and so the and so the myogenic mechanism is important for maintaining a normal GFR despite the fact that our blood pressure can rise and fall with exercise and things like that. Now the second method we can use to adjust filtration is through something called tubuloglomerular feedback. And this involves a structure called the, juxtla, the juxtaglomerular complex. And the juxtaglomerular complex is actually part of the and the juxtaglomerular complex is actually part of the distal convoluted tubule of the nephron and it lies very close to the afferent arterial. And within the juxtaglomerular complex we have a special sensory region called the macula densa. And the macula densa has cells in there that will basically monitor the osmolality or saltiness of the fluid in the tube. And if we have a lot of salt in the tube, it usually indicates that the filtrate is moving too quickly and we haven't had a chance to reabsorb as much of the salt as we like. And so if this happens, basically the macula densa will signal the afferent arterial to constrict. And this will basically reduce the filtration pressure and this will basically reduce the flow of blood into the glomerulus and also reduce the amount of filtration. Okay, the second mechanism for control of glomerular filtration rate is something called extrinsic controls. And again, extrinsic controls involve factors outside of the kidney. And basically, they only take over if the blood pressure is lower than 80 millimeters of mercury or greater than 180 millimeters of mercury, which usually doesn't happen if we're talking about a nice, healthy person. Now, the purpose of these extrinsic controls is that it will tend to reduce filtration and increase reabsorption because most of the time it's going to be when we have a lower than normal blood pressure. And in this case, we want to minimize any water loss through the kidneys, so we want to minimize filtration and also maximize reabsorption. And so this can... And there are two different types of extrinsic controls, one involving the sympathetic nervous system and the other one involving the renin, and the other one involving the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism. Okay, so let's take a look at the sympathetic nervous system control of GFR. So let's imagine that blood pressure has just plummeted. You've had somebody that's lost a lot of blood and they're hypotensive. And if their blood pressure, let's say, is in the 80s and 90s, um, that's a very big cause for concern. In this case, the adrenal medulla will secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine, which will basically cause the blood vessels in the periphery of the body to constrict. Now this constriction will help to increase blood pressure and bring it back to normal, but it will also help to reduce the flow of blood into the glomerulus. And so in this case, we are diverting blood away from the kidneys and increasing vascular resistance elsewhere in the body in order to maintain blood pressure. Okay, the next control mechanism involves the activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And remember, renin was an enzyme that helps to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. And angiotensin, as the name implies, is a hormone that is going to cause constriction of blood vessels, which is going to raise the blood pressure in the body, but also reduce the flow of blood through the glomerulus and reduce filtration rate. So this mechanism is very, very complex, and I would like you to read about it in your book because this information will be covered on the exam. Okay, welcome back to Zoology 142 Online. This is part two of our lecture on the urinary system. Now you should remember from last time that nephrons are the functional unit of the kidneys and they're basically the ones that are helping us to remove waste products from the blood but also conserve things that we want to hold on to, for example, water, glucose, and things like that. And so the nephrons have three different processes that they go through. Filtration, which is the pressure-driven movement of fluids from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. And remember, the glomerulus was essentially just a very leaky capillary bed. And everything that's filtered enters the Bowman's capsule, and the Bowman's capsule is basically a funnel, which will send stuff down into the renal tubule. 
And so reabsorption is the process of taking stuff from the renal tubule and putting it back in the bloodstream. And so that's important for reabsorbing things like water or glucose or anything that we don't want to end up in the urine. And finally, the third process is secretion. Secretion goes from the bloodstream back into the tubule. And this is a way to rid ourselves of excess waste products, for example, urea and uric acid, that we want to get out of the body. Okay, big picture is remember that anything that remains in the renal tubule by the time we get you know, to the collecting duct and beyond is usually... So the big picture here is that anything that stays in the renal tubule is eventually going to end up as urine. So anything that we don't do, so anything that we don't want to be so anything that we don't want to end up so anything that we don't want to end up so anything that we don't want to end up as urine we reabsorb back in the bloodstream. Okay, so this table just shows the different blood components that are filtered uh, and also later reabsorbed uh, by the renal tubule. So you see that on average about 180 liters of water becomes filtrate uh, for each day but on average about 178 to 179 of these liters of water are reabsorbed back in the bloodstream. So as a result we only have one to two liters ending up in the urine. Okay, same with proteins. I said proteins rarely end up in the urine um, and that's because proteins tend to be too large. Okay, now let's look at bicarbonate. 275 grams of... Let's, now let's look at... Okay, now let's look at sodium. 579 grams of sodium are filtered and about 575 grams are reabsorbed. So only four grams of so only four grams of sodium are lost in the urine. Now let's look at glucose. Now glucose is important. Now let's take a, now let's take a look at glucose. On average about 100 on average about 162 grams of glucose are filled <laughs> On average, about 162 grams of glucose is filtered per day, and 162 are reabsorbed. That is, we. Sh now let's look at glucose. On average, about 162 grams of glucose are filtered uh, out of the Bowman's capsule. Now let's take a look at glucose. On average, about 162 grams of glucose is filtered per day. That means it moves from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule into the Bowman's capsule and eventually the renal tubule. But now let's look at reabsorption. The same amount is reabsorbed, 162 grams. And what this means is that no glucose should ideally end up in the urine. And that's because glucose is a very valuable energy molecule. We don't want it just being washed into our urine because that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, now let's take a look at some things that aren't reabsorbed as much. Look at urea. We filter about 54 grams per day and reabsorb about half of that. And you can almost think of that reabsorption as being inadvertent. Um, we don't want a lot of urea in the body, and so we will actually have 30 grams of urea ending up in the bloodstream. So we'll actually have about 30 grams of urea ending up in the urine, so where did the other 6 grams come from? Well, they came from secretion. That is the process of taking this extra waste product and then putting it back into the renal tubule so that it will be excreted from the body. And finally, let's look it down at the very bottom. Okay, and finally, let's look it down at the very bottom at creatinine. Uh, creatinine is basically a byproduct of muscle metabolism, and you can see that on average, about 1.6 grams is filtered each day, and zero grams is reabsorbed. And that means that 1.7 grams of creatinine will actually end up in the urine, and that's because we have about 0.1 gram actually being secreted in there. And th and creatinine is important because it's something that's normally not reabsorbed at all. And so we can use creatinine to estimate the filtration rate. And we'll talk about that in a few slides. And so we can use creatinine to estimate the glomerular filtration rate. And we'll talk about that in a few slides. Now your book goes into quite a bit of detail about the histology of the renal tubule. Uh, we're not going to go into a whole lot of detail, but suffice it to say the renal tubule is made up of simple epithelium. And remember that simple epithelium is very good for absorption and secretion. So there are two ways that things can get reabsorbed. One is they can take a paracellular route, that is they can go between cells to enter the bloodstream. And this tends to happen for very small molecules, uh, nonpolar molecules, whereas most of the things will be taking a transcellular reabsorption route. That is, they're going 
through cells, and in order to go through cells and enter the bloodstream, they usually have to go through a membrane-specific protein. Now let's talk about now let's talk about the way that, now let's talk about the mechanisms by which a lot of these substances now let's talk about the mechanisms by which the substances now let's talk about the now we're going to talk about the mechanisms by which a lot of the filtrate is reabsorbed back in the bloodstream. So solutes can move across so both water and solutes can move across either a paracellular or a transcellular route. Um, the primary Again, most of these things tend to take a transcellular route that is going across the cell, and in this case, you're going to have a special carrier protein. And the most important one of these is sodium. Uh, sodium crosses via a transcellular route, and it has a special carrier protein. And we use active transport to do this. That is, we spend some ATP to help pump sodium from the inside of the tubule into the paratubular capillaries. And this uphill and this forced movement of sodium from inside the tubule into the interstitial spaces and into the bloodstream also creates an electrochemical gradient which helps to move things like chloride ions, which are negatively charged, again, back from the tubule into the bloodstream. It also helps with the secondary transport. It also helps with the secondary active transport of many other, of many other solutes, for example, glucose and amino acids. And finally, there's, and finally the third mechanism and finally, the third mechanism which we can use. And finally, the third mechanism we can use to move things across the tubule is just passive transport, simple osmosis or diffusion. Now, think about if sodium is moving from the tubule into the bloodstream, where does water want to go? Well, water always wants to follow the solute. That's because solutes suck. So, if sodium moves from the tubule into the paratubular capillaries, you're going to get you're going to you can bet that water wants to go that way too. And so water tends to move just through the process of solute drag. And so water tends to move just through the process of solvent drag. Lipids, some other ion, now lipid soluble compounds may also trans, now lipid soluble compounds may also, now lipid soluble compounds may also cross in a passive, now, lipid-soluble compounds may also cross through simple diffusion. That is a passive process. And the majority of things that uses the majority of the majority of solutes that utilize passive transport are going to be ones that cross the cell membranes. Are going to be ones that go in between cells. That is, they take a paracellular route. Now, remember, we said that most of the solutes are going to be crossing from the renal tube uh, into the paratubular capillaries through a transport protein. And so transport proteins are the primary way in which we reabsorb things like glucose and also sodium. And so basically our ability to do this is based on the number of transport proteins and also on the concentration of the solute that we're reabsorbing within the tubule. If we only have a little bit of sodium or a little bit of glucose, we can basically reabsorb all that we want. Whereas if we have too much glucose or too much sodium, it's possible we're not going to be able to absorb all that we want and that some of that might end up in the urine. Now I like to think about these transport proteins that are in the renal tubule as being analogous to checkout lanes at a busy shopping market, at a busy supermarket. So here you can see that we have a supermarket. Uh, there's about 20 checkout lanes that are open, and you can see there's only five or six shoppers. And so in this case, you can imagine that it would be easy for all the shoppers that are there to get through the checkout lanes, because there's plenty of checkout lanes available. And so in this case, imagine moving through the checkout lanes is essentially reabsorption. We're going from inside the store or inside the tubule through the checkout lane or through the protein and out into the interstitial spaces. That's what reabsorption is. Now I want you to imagine a different scenario. We still have 20 checkout lanes that are open, but now we have, let's say, 2,000 people that are shopping in this store. No matter how many checkout lanes you have, I don't care, I don't care how fast the people work, 20 checkout lanes is not going to be enough for 2,000 people to check out. And so some of the people will be able to check out or be reabsorbed, whereas the majority of people, whereas many people will probably just walk out of the store and without purchasing anything, Whereas many people may just walk past the checkout, whereas many people will get discouraged and just walk out of the store without checking out in the first place. And this is essentially what happens. And this is essentially what happens when and this is essentially what happens when some of these transport proteins are overloaded by solute.
And a, an example of this is something called glucosuria. Glucose is, of course, sugar, and urea, per, and, and urea, and urea refers to the urine. So basically, this is the, so basically, this is the state of having glucose in the urine. Remember, we said that glucose, of course, is part of the blood plasma, and that a lot of glucose is filtered. That is, it enters the renal corpuscle and enters the renal tubule. But we also said that 100% of that glucose is usually reabsorbed. The only exception is if we have a person that has much higher levels of blood glucose than they normally should. So normally blood glucose levels are about 90 milligrams per deciliter. On the other hand, if you have diabetes mellitus and it's not controlled, it can be up to 180 milligrams per deciliter. In this case, is in this, in this case, it's essentially like having too many shoppers and not enough checkout lanes. As that fluid moves through the renal tubule, there's not enough there's not enough proteins and not enough time to reabsorb all of the glucose because there's so much of it. As a result, we start to see glucose appearing in the urine, glucosuria. And so glucosuria is an abnormal finding. We definitely don't see it in healthy people. And when we do see it in somebody's urine, it's a good indicator that they may have diabetes mellitus. So now we're going to take a look at the reabsorption of fluid across the renal tubule. So now we're going to take a look at the reabsorption of fluid across the different parts of the renal tubule. Remember the part of the renal tubule that's just Remember the first part of the renal tubule is something called the proximal convoluted tubule. We said it was a proximal convoluted tubule because it's right next to the Bowman's capsule. So the proximal convoluted tubule is very important for reabsorption. About 65% of the water, sodium, uh, about 65% of the water and sodium that are reabsorbed in the nephron are reabsorbed here. And 100% of the glucose that's reabsorbed is reabsorbed here as well. We tend to call the water reabsorption that happens at the proximal convoluted tubule obligatory water, obligatory water reabsorption. That is, we cannot adjust it. There's no way to, that is, there's no way to adjust it. We also reabsorb about 50% of the urea as well as other solutes too. If you take a look at your textbook, you'll see that the reabsorption of these various solutes in the proximal convoluted tubule is somewhat complex. But the big picture here is that we're spending energy in the form of ATP to move sodium from inside the tubule out into the interstitial spaces and eventually into the paratubular capsules and eventually into the paratubular capillaries. Now, because sodium is positively charged, it tends to bring chloride along with it. So chloride oftentimes will follow sodium. On the other hand, take a look at what hydrogen does. We actually have a protein that allows sodium in while hydrogen is going out. And so hydrogen ions can move into the tubule and basically be secreted um, through what we call an antiport system. Now let's take a look at reabsorption at the loop of Henle. Remember the loop of Henle was that U-shaped loop that tends to dip down into the medulla of the kidney. And there's two limbs to that, the descending limb, which goes down, and the ascending limb, which goes up. So let's take a look first at the descending limb. Now unlike the proximal convoluted tubule, which was permeable to both water and solute, the descending limb of the loop of Henle is only permeable to water. It is not really permeable to sodium. And so what happens is we tend to pull water out, but sodium stands behind. And so take a look at the numbers that are written inside that tubule. You can see that they start at 300 and then go to 350 and 550 and 750. And basically this indicates a rise in the osmolality or saltiness of the fluid within the tubule because there's two ways to make things salty. One, add more salt, or two, remove the water from the solution. And this is essentially what's going on in the descending loop of Henle. Water is being pulled out and sodium is remaining behind. And so in that case, the, so in that case, the osmolality of the tube increases as it descends down into the medulla, as it descends down into the medulla. Now let's take a look at the osmolality of, now let's take a look at what's going on inside the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. The ascending limb is permeable to solutes like salt, but is not permeable to water. 
So in this case, we continue to use active transport to pull salt or sodium out of the out of the descending limb, and this tends to make the osmolality less. Basically, we're taking salt out and leaving more water behind. And so as we move up the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, the osmolality will start to decrease, going from 350 down to 150 down to 100. Remember, the osmolality of normal blood plasma is about 300 milliosmoles. And so in this case, at 100, we're about one-third of the osmolality of regular blood. So we're very, very dilute at the point when we reach the distal convoluted tubule. So again, here's a picture of the nephron in a larger so here's a larger picture of the nephron that shows what's going on with the osmolality. Remember that the osmolality of blood is around 300 milliosmoles per liter. So we can take a look at the filtrate that's entering the Bowman's capsule and moving through the proximal convoluted tubule. It's 300 milliosmoles. Now you might say, well, it's 300 going in and it's 300 going out, so why hasn't it changed? The reason is, is that in the proximal convoluted tubule, the removal of water and sodium basically follow a one-to-one -one ratio. So yes, we're pulling a sodium molecule, so yes, we're pulling sodium ions out, but at the same time, we're pulling out water molecules as well. So if we pull them out in approximately a one-to-one -one ratio, we can reduce the volume of fluid that is inside the tubule without affecting the osmolality. Now let's take a look at the descending limb of the loop of Henle. Look at the numbers. They're going up. So why are they going up? Well, that's because the descending limb of the loop of Henle is permeable to water. Water is pulled out and reabsorbed by the peritubular capillaries, leaving more and more solute behind. Now let's go up the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. You can see the numbers are getting less and less. And that's because the ascending limb is permeable to sodium, but not permeable to water. So we're able to continue to pull sodium out and put that in the bloodstream via active transport, but the water stays behind because because there's no because there's no because there's no because the tubule is impermeable to water. And so now we get to the point where we're entering the distal convoluted tubule at about 100 milliosmoles, or one third the salinity, or one third this, or one third the saltiness of normal blood. So here we're at our last part of a renal tubule called the distal convoluted tubule. Here we have fluid that's entering this tubule at approximately 25 milliliters per minute. Remember that the GFR was 125 milliliters per minute. So the big picture here is that the majority of fluid has already been reabsorbed. And that was called obligatory water reabsorption because we can't really adjust it. And so we're going to absorb a little bit more water here as well as some sodium and some chloride. Uh, it's also the site where we're going to have the distal convoluted tubule is also a major site for reabsorption of calcium ions as mediated by parathyroid hormone. Remember, parathyroid hormone was secreted. Um, remember, parathyroid hormone was secreted by your parathyroid glands in response to hypocalcemia, and it did a couple of things. One is it increased the rate at which the osteoclasts broke down bone, so we would have more calcium for the bloodstream. But it also helps to conserve calcium in the kidneys and prevent it from being lost in the urine. On the other hand, if you have high blood calcium levels, we're not going to have much reabsorption of calcium here at the DCT, and that's going to be lost in the urine. Stop it. Okay, so now, okay, so what's, the, so any remaining fluid that's not reabsorbed in the distal convoluted tubule will then enter the collecting duct. The collecting duct is a place now the collecting duct is a large shaft that is usually connected to several nephrons and the filtrate that moves into that collecting duct is destined to be in the urine unless we reabsorb it. And so at this point about 90 to 95 percent of the water has already been reabsorbed. And remember this has been obligatory water reabsorption. It happened because it followed sodium out of the tubule and there's really no way to adjust it. Now. Now, the collect now it's very important to point out that the collecting duct is different. The collecting duct is the site of facultative water reabsorption. The collecting duct is, in fact, the site of facultative water reabsorption. That is, we can adjust the amount of water that's reabsorbed based on our hydration status. 
If we're really dehydrated, we want to make sure that we reabsorb as much water as possible so that we can keep up blood volume and blood pressure. On the other hand, if we just drank one of those 357 ounce bladder busters from 7-Eleven, uh, we probably don't want to reabsorb any of the excess water. So there's special cells within the collecting duct that help us to reabsorb sodium and also excrete potassium based on dietary intake. As it turns out, uh, potassium actually can build up in toxic levels in the body pretty quickly. And so this is a place where we can secrete cap so this is a place where we can get rid of that extra potassium and put it back into the filtrate. Now the Now tubular reabsorption now, tubular reabsorption at the point of the collecting duct is regulated by several hormones, including ADH, or antidiuretic hormone. And ADH is probably the most important hormone and the one that you need to know. ADH is produced by the posterior pituitary, and it's secreted in times of dehydration. That is, when the blood osmolality is higher than normal because we have less water in there. And what it does is increase the facultative reabsorption of water at the collecting duct. Now remember we said that the renin angiotensin aldosterone system was important for regulating the glomerular filtration rate. Well it's even more important for regulating tubular reabsorption. Remember this is here to help us to maintain blood pressure when it starts to drop. And so when blood pressure and blood volume are low, arterioles will be stretched less. In response to this low stretching, the arterioles will in response to this low stretching, renin will be secreted by the juxtaglomerular cells. Now remember, renin is an enzyme that will help us to convert angiotensinogen, which is inactive, eventually into angiotensin 1 and then angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is the active form of the hormone, and that's going to cause vasoconstriction. This vasoconstriction will actually cause the glomerular filtration rate to drop because we've constricted our afferent arterioles and it will also cause an enhanced sodium and water reabsorption. This enhanced sodium and water reabsorption will also help us to jack up the blood pressure because more water will remain in the blood instead of being lost in the urine. And finally aldosterone And finally, aldosterone is also secreted at times of low blood pressure. It helps to reabsorb sodium and chloride by the principal cells of the collecting duct. It also helps us to increase the secretion of potassium into the urine. As a result, electrolytes are conserved. And remember, what does water do? What does water do? Water tends to follow the electrolytes. And so more water into the tube, and so more, wa and so more electrolytes reabsorbed equals more water reabsorbed, which means we're going to have a large <laughs> <coughs> which means we're going to have a larger blood volume and a smaller urine volume. Now that the way now the way that ADH now the way that ADH enhances facultative reabsorption of water is that it causes special proteins called aquaporins to be inserted in the collecting duct membrane. And it's these special proteins that allow water to move from the collecting duct uh, into the interstitial spaces and eventually back into the paratubular capillaries. Ordinarily, without these aquaporins, the collecting duct membrane would be impermeable to water, and so there would be no way to reabsorb it. But the more ADH we have, the more aquaporins we have, and the faster fluid will move from the collecting duct into the interstitial spaces. So the result of increases in ADH levels is that more water remains in the blood. So the result so the result of higher so the result of higher so the result of elevated ADH levels is that more fluid will be reabsorbed and less will be lost in the urine. That is, we are maintaining blood volume at the expense of producing a very that is, we tend to maintain blood volume and produce a very small and concentrated urine volume. So another hormone that affects water reabsorption is something called atrial natriuretic peptide. Atrial, atrial natriuretic peptide is produced by the walls of the atrium in response to large increases in blood volume. Remember, a large increase in blood volume is going to cause a rise in blood pressure. In this case, ANP travels from the 
travels from the heart uh, through the bloodstream uh, to the kidneys where it inhibits reabsorption of sodium and water at the proximal convoluted tubule. Now in this case, if we're not reabsorbing sodium, we're also having a very hard time reabsorbing water. And so in this case, we can end up with more water remaining within the tubule and less of it being reabsorbed. And what this helps us do is get rid of excess water by leaving it in the renal tubule and losing it in the urine. And so ANP essentially works in the opposite direction of ADH. ADH helps us to conserve water and keep it in the blood, whereas ANP helps us to take that extra fluid out of the blood and get rid of it in the urine. Now depending on the concentration of ADH, we can either have a very concentrated urine, as you see at left, or a very dilute urine. And remember the concentration of ADH secreted will be dependent on your blood osmolality. If you're dehydrated, you're going to have rel relatively salty blood and your hypothalamus is going to respond by triggering an increase in ADH secretion by your posterior pituitary. And that's going to cause greater than normal reabsorption of fluids uh, from the kidney uh, from the tubule into the paratubular capillaries. And this means you're going to produce urine that's very low in volume and also very concentrated. On the other hand, imagine that you've had a lot of fluid to drink today. Again, you drank one of those bladder busters that has like a thousand ounces of fluid in there. And in this case, the secretion of ADH is going to be inhibited. And without ADH, we're not going to have any facultative reabsorption of water at the collecting duct. That is, all the water that was in the collecting duct when it enters is still going to be there when it leaves. And so that excess water and sodium is going to be lost in the urine. In this case, we're going to get a very dilute urine and probably a large volume of it as well. Now just remember that, now this slide's now this slide's here just as a reminder, we have two different types of water reabsorption across the nephron. We had obligatory water reabsorption happening at the proximal convoluted tubule and also the descending loop of Henle. This is basically water this is basically water reabsorption that we can't alter. It's going to happen no matter what. Now on the other hand, we have facultative or adjustable water reabsorption happening at the collecting duct. And this is controlled again by ADH. Remember, ADH is secreted when we're dehydrated, and it basically inserts more of those aquaporin proteins into the collecting duct membrane, allowing more fluid to be reabsorbed from the collecting duct and placed back into the bloodstream. Okay, now let's take a look at how we produce dilute urine. Dilute urine is produced when we have a high level of fluid intake, that is, we're very well hydrated, in fact, overly hydrated. In this case, because we're overly hydrated, levels of ADH are going to be low. The starting osmolality of blood plasma is around 300 milliosmoles, and so that's what we have entering the proximal convoluted tubule. Now remember, the osmolality does not change as we go through the proximal convoluted tubule, even though we're absorbing lots of water and lots of sodium, because it tends to be on a one-to-one -one basis. One sodium ion for one water molecule. And so the osmolality of fluid entering the descending limb of the loop of Henle is still 300 milliosmoles. Now, as we go down the loop of Henle, you're going to see that osmolality increase, again, because we're pulling off water, but not pulling off any solid. And as we go up the ascending limb, the, the osmolality, in fact, decreases, because here we're pulling out water and leaving the solute behind. Now, again, once we get to the collecting duct, this is the point where we have a chance for facultative water reabsorption. But we don't want to do water. But in this case, we don't want to do facultative water reabsorption, because we have plenty of fluid in the body. So without ADH, we don't have any aquaporins, and without any aquaporins, the f and without any aquaporins, the fluid that leaves the body is going to be around 65 milliosmoles per liter, and that's going to be about one fifth the osmolality of normal blood. And so in this case, you're going to produce a urine that has one fifth the solute concentration of normal blood plasma. Okay, now let's take a look at how we produce concentrated urine. Remember, we're going to produce concentrated urine when we are dehydrated. When we're dehydrated, we're going to secrete a lot of ADH. And ADH is going to enhance the facultative reabsorption of water at the collecting duct. Sounds like a test question, doesn't it? Anyway, 
This involves principally the long loop juxtamedullary nephrons. These are the nephrons that go way down in the medulla and allow us to produce very, very concentrated urine. So the pres so one of the things that ADH does is induce a very high osmotic gradient between the tubule and the medulla. That is a very big difference between the salt concentration on the outside and inside the tubule. And in general, it tends to be saltier uh, outside the tubule because we have lots of urea there. And that helps to draw the extra water out of the tubule into the capillaries when the aquaporins are in that collecting duct. Now, so when we're dehydrated, the osmolality of fluid entering the proximal convoluted tubule is going to be the same. It's going to be about 300 milliosmoles. And again, it doesn't change as it goes across the proximal convoluted tubule. Once we get in the descending limb of Luva Henle, you can see that it's becoming more and more and more concentrated. So that when we get down to the end of, so when we get down to the U bend of the Luva Henle, you can see that the osmolality here is about 1,200 milliosmoles, or about four times the osmolality, or about four times the osmolality or saltiness of normal blood. Now take a look at what happens as it moves up the ascending limb of the Luva Henle. Yeah, it starts to decrease because we're pulling off sodium and leaving water behind. But now let's take a look at what happens in the collecting duct. Initially, the initially initially the initially the filtrate that was entering the collecting duct has an osmolality of around 300 milliosmoles. Now that's about a, now again that's about the normal osmolality of blood. But now take what now take a look at what happens as now take a look at what happens as that fluid moves down the collecting duct. Because we have ADH, we have more facultative reabsorption of water through those aquaporins. And as a result, the and as and as a result, the osmolality of the fluid in the tubule gets saltier and saltier and saltier as we transit that collecting duct. So that we see what comes out has an osmolality of twelve hundred milliosmoles. And this is about four times the saltiness or osmolality of normal blood. So in this case, we're producing a very small volume of a very concentrated urine in order to conserve water. Now, one of the reasons that the juxtamedullary nephrons are so good at conserving water is that there's something called a countercurrent exchange mechanism going on. And instead of talking to you about it with a static picture, I found a great uh, animation about this on the internet, on YouTube. So I would like you to stop the lecture at this point and click on the link. Now the guy is British and he does have a funny accent. So after you're done, let, but he does, but he does do a very good, but he does do a good, but he does do a very good job at explaining how a countercurrent multiplier mechanism works.
So now we're going to talk about some tests used to evaluate kidney function. We said one of the things that we commonly evaluate with uh, kidney patients is their glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. And the way in which we do that is we look at substances that are passed on in the urine and also look at their concentration of blood. For example, creatinine is a byproduct of muscle metabolism, and it is filtered in the glomerulus, but not reabsorbed at all. And so we can look at the concentration of creatinine in both the blood and in the urine collected in a 24-hour period and get a pretty accurate uh, indicator of the GFR, or glomerular filtration rate. More recently, we've used a plant polysaccharide called anulin to estimate GFR, but this has to be administered before you conduct the GR before you do the GFR test. But obviously this has to be administered before you collect the urine and do the GFR test. Now we said before that an average, um, now we said before that an average GFR would be somewhere around 120 millimeter. Now we said before that an average GFR would be around 120 milliliters per minute, but this really depends on the person as well as the ethnic group. Uh, African Americans tend to have lower GFRs than Caucasians do. In general, if your GFR is between 60 and 120, we say that you have a normal glomerular filtration rate. On the other hand, if it's between 15 and 60 for more than three months, we say that you have chronic kidney disease. And if it's below 15, we say that you are in kidney failure. And certainly somebody that is in kidney failure would be at grave danger. Uh, we probably want to do dialysis uh, on a daily basis. <laughs> So we classify a patient as having chronic renal disease when their GFR falls below 60 milliliters per minute for more than three months. We say more than three months because there are several disease conditions and medications that can temporarily reduce your GFR, but that may not be a permanent thing. If on the other hand, if your GFR hasn't come up after three months and it's still uh, below 60, it probably indicates that it's a chronic long-standing condition. And remember, renal failure is a GFR less than 15 milliliters per minute. And that's going to result in some pretty nasty conditions like uremia, which is basically just urine within the blood, or azotemia, which means that we have a lot of dissolved nitrogen compounds within the bloodstream, higher than normal levels of, um, higher than normal levels of, for example, higher, for example, higher than normal levels of uric acid and urea. Another thing that can happen in kidney failure is that we get anemia. Remember that the kidney was responsible for secreting, remember that the kidney was responsible for manufacturing and secreting erythropoietin, uh, and erythropoietin was responsible for the division, and, and erythropoietin was responsible for stimulating the production of red blood cells. So if the kidneys are so damaged, they don't produce a whole lot of erythropoietin, and so we tend to have, and so we don't have as much and so we don't have as many red blood cells as we should, so as a result, we're anemic. Okay, according to your textbook, diabetes mellitus and hypertension are the top two causes of renal disease nationwide. In particular, diabetes mellitus is very prevalent here in Hawaii and is responsible for a large proportion of the people that are on dialysis or on the waiting list for getting kidney transplants. Now you're probably familiar with the process of dialysis or hemodialysis. This is a process where we can cleanse the blood of somebody that has impaired kidney function. So if somebody is in kidney failure, we can extend their life by periodically taking blood out of their body and running it through a dialysis machine. The dialysis machine basically contains a membrane through which the blood flows that allows solutes such as urea to move out of the blood into the dialysate solution. The dialysate solution doesn't have any urea, and so urea tends to move from an area of high concentration, that is in the blood, to an area of low concentration within the dialysate solution. And so that helps to draw these toxic waste materials out. And we also may put, let's say, glucose inside the dialysate solution in order to get some of that glucose to move backwards uh, into the, the blood side, or the patient side, uh, to help with nutrition. And so depending on somebody's, in case, and obviously this, obviously this dialysate, uh, obviously the dialysate solution has to be changed out very, very frequently in order to, 
and obviously the dialysate solution has to be changed out frequently in order to prevent accumulation of excess urea and so forth in there. Uh, and typically people will go in for dialysis sometimes once a day, sometimes three days a week. It just depends on how impaired their kidney function is. Now, as you can probably gather from the previous slide, you're not going to go through hemodialysis at home unless you're really rich and have your own dialysis machine. And so what that means is that people have to go to the so people have to go to a dialysis clinic and what this means is that people have to take time out of their day and go to a dialysis clinic for a couple hours and two to three days a week. And so this can be very frustrating. And so there is a type of dialysis you can do while you're traveling or you can even, so there is a type of dialysis you can do at home or even while you're traveling called peritoneal dialysis. Basically we insert a catheter into the abdominal cavity <coughs> and we infiltrate the abdominal cavity with this dialysate solution and it works the same way and so instead of in exchanging the waste products with the bloodstream, we're actually exchanging the waste products with the peritoneum or the peritoneal membrane within the abdominal cavity. So typically you do two to three changes of the dialysate solution over a period of time and drain it and you would be, and, and in this way you'd be able to remove most of the waste materials such as urea without having to go into the dialysis clinic. So now we're going to go on and talk about some of the physical and chemical characteristics of urine. Uh, probably this week or next week, you're going to be involved in doing a urinalysis, a urinalysis experiment in lab. Basically, we're going to have you urinate in a cup. Basically, we're going to have basically we're going to give you something to drink and then have you urinate every half hour for three hours to see what effect that particular beverage had on the volume of urine you produced and also on the osmolality or and also on the specific gravity or density so this so the specific gravity which is abbreviate which is abbreviated SPG is just a measurement of the density of the fluid normally water normally distilled water has a specific gravity of 1.000 which means that one milliliter of water weighs exactly one gram. Now any solutes that we add to this fluid is going to increase the specific gravity. So specific gravity of urine typically is going to be greater than, greater than that of distilled water because it has solutes. And we measure this specific gravity with something called a refractometer. So at the left hand side you can see somebody placing a drop of urine on the prism of the refractometer. We then close a cover over that prism and look at it in the light and basically the refraction of light through that prism and through the urine will give us an indication of the specific gravity. Here you can see the specific gravity of the urine sample is 1.020 which is fairly concentrated. <coughs> and again, <coughs> again we tend to, again we tend our kidneys tend to adjust the concentration of the urine based on how hydrated we are and also based on the production of ADH from the posterior pituitary. Of course another characteristic of urine is its color. Color can be used as a good indicator of its concentration. Basically light colored urine indicates that you're very well hydrated whereas very dark colored urine indicates that you're dehydrated and your kidneys have produced some very concentrated urine. Of course, if you're taking vitamin supplements, that can make your urine green or abnormal colors. If you eat lots of beets, you could have red urine, even though you don't have any blood in there. And of course, if you have kid, and of course, if you have any kind of liver failure, we can expect to see a dark brown or red urine, and that's definitely a bad sign. Now we're going to talk about the pH of urine. Remember the pH scale is used to estimate the amount of either hydrogen ions or bicarbonate ions in the urine. Uh, or bicarbonate or bicarbonate ions in a fluid. And so urine typically has an acidic pH. It can be anywhere between 4.5, which is really acidic, and 8, which is alkaline, but the average is 6, that is slightly acidic. It tends to be more basic in vegans because they're getting a higher proportion of basic plant material in there that's called ash. And so vegans oftentimes will have a more neutral or even basic pH of urine. Now changes in pH can also, sometimes changes in pH can also indicate your, per, now sometimes a change in pH of your urine can also indicate that you may have a urinary tract infection and we'll talk about that in laboratory next week. So you probably see urine at least three or four times a day but did you ever think about what exactly is in there?
Well, we already know that, of course, there's a lot of water in there. Urine is, in fact, about 95% water and about 5% solutes. And these solutes can and these solids include things we've talked about, such as urea and uric acid. And remember, these were nitrogenous compounds that are somewhat toxic and come from the breakdown of amino acids. And so we tend to need to get those out of the body fairly quickly. Another component we'll find in urine was creatinine. Remember, creatinine was a natural byproduct of muscle metabolism. And it is filtered in urine, and it's not reabsorbed. So we will use creatinine to estimate your, glo your glomerular filtration rate. Of course, we also find electrolytes in the urine, such as sodium and potassium. Potassium is actually an electrolyte that we try to get rid of most of the time through the urine, whereas sodium is one that we're often trying to conserve. We also have some, we also have small amounts of phosphate and sulfate that are passed in the urine. Initially, urine doesn't smell very bad, but if you leave urine out at room temperature for even a few hours, you will notice a very distinctive off color. And that's because bacteria can quickly start to break down the urea into nitrate and can start to break down the urea and uric acid into ammonia and more pungent compounds. <coughs> okay, now we're going to talk about some of the diseases and disorders of the kidney. And one of these is the kidney stone. Now, kidney stones are also called uroliths, and basically they are formations of either calcium, magnesium, or other minerals that collect inside the ureter or renal pelvis of the kidney. Uh, oftentimes, they're fairly small, less than, five milliliter, less than five millimeters, and in which case they tend to pass through the ureter and eventually be expressed from the bladder. On the other hand, larger kidney stones may require either surgery or something called shock wave lithotripsy, where they basically place you in a bath of fluid and then they crush that stone using sound waves. And then they crush that stone using lithotripsy or sound wave therapy. Now, now anybody can now in fact anybody can get a urolith or a kidney stone, but there are some predisposing factors that tends to make it more common. One is the type of water you drink, the area, one is the area of the country that you live in. If you know about the Bible Belt down in the American South, you may also be familiar that it's also called the Kidney Stone Belt. And, and that's because this area of the country typically has a lot of dissolved, uh, it typically has a lot of dissolved inorganic minerals in the water, such as, let's say, calcium carbonate. And if you drink, uh, and if you're constantly drinking fluid that is high in these if you're constantly drinking fluids that are high in these inorganic molecules, your propensity to develop a kidney stone may be greatly increased. The other thing that can increase your chances of getting a kidney stone is having alkaline urine or having frequently or having frequent infections of the urinary tract because this also alters the pH of the urine and makes things that are normally soluble insoluble. So these insoluble and makes things that are normally soluble in urine insoluble. So we start to get calcification happening within the kidney. Okay, and finally, before ending this week's lecture, I just want to talk about a common question that I get, can I drink my own urine? Well, the answer is yes, you can drink your own urine, but do you want to? Uh, urine contains water, true, but it also contains a lot of waste products. It contains urea and uric acid and creatinine, most of which you don't really want to drink. Um, so ideally, you don't want to drink your own urine unless you're you know, basically in a place where you have nothing else to drink. Um, some people have proposed that urine has some health benefits, and I'm thinking these are pretty much bogus. Um, people oftentimes say, well, urine is quite sterile. And that's true, unless it's not. Uh, think about urinary tract infections. Uh, so it is possible to have a UTI and transmit bacteria back into yourself by drinking that urine. The other thing is that even if urine is initially sterile, when it comes out, it travels through the urethra, which is not sterile. And finally, just sitting there for 15, 20 minutes, those bacteria that were in your that were in your urethra are going to break down that urine very, very quickly. And so if you take your, a drink of urine that's been sitting around, or do as some people do here, and, and put it on cuts, uh, you're basically asking for an infection. And so the and so the short an and so the short of it is, no, there is no medically sound reason to drink your own urine. Uh, you will still, and so the short of it is, there is no medically, and so the short answer, so, okay, so the big picture is, okay, so, so the take-home message is, no, there is no medical evidence that drinking your, 
So the big mex so the take home message is there's absolutely so the take home message so the take home message here is that there's absolutely no medical evidence that drinking your urine will help you in any way. So unless you have a taste for it, I would recommend against it. This concludes the lecture on the urinary system. Uh, be sure to read the following topics that we did not cover in lecture. Please read about the anatomy of the ureters, urinary bladder, and urethra. Please, please read about the anatomy of the ureters, urinary bladder, and urethra. And also, please learn about the micturation reflex. And also, please read about the micturation reflex.